Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our second session of the RSET webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Scenario-Based Eco-Forecasting. My name is Amber McCollum, and today we will have a um, guest speaker, Helen Sofer, from the USGS um, Fort Collins Science Center um, as your instructor. And first, I just have a few reminders for you all. Um, as you know, this course will have four one-hour sessions each Thursday from September 7th to the 28th um, from one, uh, 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So we're going to have lectures followed by short Q, um, question and answer session. You can find all of the course materials at the website listed in Spanish and English. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can um, feel free to email myself or my colleague, Cynthia Schmidt, at the email address listed below. We will have two homework assignments, which will be submitted through Google Forms. The first homework links are available on the RSET website, and I've also posted them in um, the question um, tab here along the side of your um, panel. Um, the Spanish version for the homework will be available within the next couple of days. So um, if you want to use that one, check back on the RSET website then. Um, and then the second homework link will be available um, during week four. The homework deadline for the first homework is September 28th. So you have two weeks to um, complete and submit that homework assignment. To receive a certificate of completion, you need to attend three out of four live webinars and complete both homework assignments. Then you can expect to receive a um, certificate of completion about two months after the completion of the course. There's one prerequisite for this course, and that's the fundamentals of remote sensing, and that's um, the one listed on the, web, on the um, slide here. As I mentioned, you can access all the course materials here on the website. You have um, presentation slides in both English and Spanish. In the conference room, looking the right And um, you can also view the recordings. And in order to view the recordings, you just need to enter your information again on the website, and you'll be taken directly to, to view those recordings. This just help us helps us keep track of who is viewing the recordings. So again, here's an overview of our course agenda. This week we'll be providing an, an overview of climate science and data. So our guest speaker will um, discuss a variety of topics, first being gridded historic climate data. Uh, then she'll provide an overview of global climate models, including techniques to use those data and some of the limitations. And then um, she'll discuss climate projections, including key features and model selection factors. And then um, if there's time at the end, we'll have a short um, question and answer session. So now I'm going to hand it over to our guest speaker. So if you just bear with us for a moment or two, we're going to um, transfer the, the screen sharing over to our guest speaker here. Thanks for having me today. I'm Helen Sofer, and I'm going to provide some background on climate science and climate data and talk about um, the appropriate use of climate products in ecological modeling. So as Amber said, I'm going to start by talking about gridded historical climate data, which are really commonly used products um, for ecological studies. So the reason that climate information is so important and so widely used is that climate and weather drive key ecological processes. Um, the difference between climate and weather is the time scale. So climate is weather summarized over long periods, often 30-year um, periods, for example. And climate is the major driver of large-scale ecological patterns. We see that here on the left. This is a classic um, biome classification diagram first produced by uh, Whitaker um, about 50 years ago. 
And it shows how average annual temperature here on the x-axis and annual precipitation um, really explain uh, global patterns of uh, biomes um, across the world. And so if you know just these two variables, the averages of these two variables, um, you can do a relatively good job of predicting what kind of ecosystem there's going to be. Um, at shorter timescales, weather has uh, really important effects on ecological systems as well. So these are pictures from a 2003 uh, heat wave in the Mediterranean. And this is a study that uh, documented coral death, um, which is often called coral bleaching, because you can see here it turns corals white um, following this heat wave. So, so again, this is driven by this ecological response. The coral death uh, is driven by um, this short-term weather pattern. And so these are just two examples that span a range of the types of ecological responses that are strongly affected by climate and weather. And studies at broad spatial scales usually use gridded climate data to understand the patterns they're looking at, whereas a local study might just use a local weather station. Um, but broad scale studies link the ecological response whatever it is that's of interest to the weather and climate in the grid cell in the location where those ecological data were collected. Um, and these gridded historical climate data sets are basically estimated from a network of long-term climate stations. So these climate stations are found worldwide, but there are many more in some parts of the world. So for example, the US stands out here um, in terms of both the number of climate stations and the length of time that they've been operating. And so it's important to recognize that the quality of climate and weather information really depends on the density of stations and also on the topography of the region. So in mountainous areas, um, more, station, more stations are needed uh, because the weather changes more quickly over space. And what I think is important to keep in mind is that we often think about these gridded data sets of um, historical climate as observations, but they're really estimates themselves. And this is because most cells in the gridded layer, i.e. in the world, um, don't have a climate station within them. Um, and so this is uh, an example of a study um, that was published relatively recently that compares uh, different historical climate data sets. So uh, the graphs here show comparisons between uh, measurements in a given location and um, the amount of bias in these different climate data sets. And these are some of the major climate data sets that are available for um, the United States, the continental United States. So for those listeners with projects um, in the US, this is actually a, this paper um, by Benke et al. Uh, that came out last year is actually a pretty good um, resource uh, for just understanding what climate products are out there. Um, and in terms of the uncertainty in historical climate, um, it's greater in general in mountainous areas. Um, and this is true even in countries like the US that have a good network of climate stations. So um, different products can qualitatively differ, come to really different answers about simple questions, like in this case, um, is more warming happening in the mountains? So are, are high elevation areas heating up um, at a faster rate, just over the historical period, not even looking forwards? Um, and so, for example, this data set on the right, uh, DayMet, shows a lot faster warming in the mountains, um, but this more recent analysis on the left um, in this data product called TopoWX um, actually doesn't show much support 
for a higher rate of warming in the mountains. Um, and this is even for uh, temperature data. So here we're looking at the uh, change, um, the number of degrees C per that shift, the shift in degrees C per decade, so how much it warmed up. Um, and actually, uh, precipitation data are even more uncertain than temperature data because they're uh, more weakly correlated over space. So another way of saying that is if it's um, hot in one place, um, it's probably going to be quite hot nearby. But um, when you get uh, thunderstorms and things like that, they can be very local. And so precipitation varies at a much smaller spatial scale. All right, so as I mentioned, there are many available historical climate data sets, and these differ in their spatial coverage, spatial resolution. The resolution is the grid cell size, um, and the time period over which they're avail available, and the variables that they provide. Um, so a uh, major data set that's available globally is WorldClim. Um, and this is a really widely used data set that covers terrestrial areas um, across the world uh, and um, does offer uh, a set of variables um, including temperature, precipitation, um, measures of r radiation and things like vapor pressure um, and also what are termed the bioclimatic variables. Um, Another example of a data set that's available from the US is uh, this uh, MET data from the University of Idaho, which is a daily data set. Um, it's just available in the continental United States um, and um, actually is great because it provides um, some sort of calculated metrics um, related to drought and water availability, in particular this reference of evapotranspiration. Um, so different, these, uh, these derived variables are actually becoming more easily accessible. This is a website called Climate Engine uh, that serves both some remote sensing data and also um, these climate data from the University of Idaho. Uh, and this is an example of what, a screenshot of what that website looks like. And you can um, customize the time period that uh, the data are summarized over. All right, so uh, the next um, kind of general subject I wanted to talk about are global climate models and the data that they produce. So global climate models uh, encompass a wide range of uh, levels of complexity. And each model differs in the details of how the physical processes um, are, are modeled and represented in the model. So on the left here, you can see a schematic um, of a classic global climate model, or GCM, um, that models the ocean, the land, service, the land surface, um, the sea ice, and the atmosphere. And the atmosphere. Um, and more recent models are called Earth system models. Um, and these include much more complexity in the feedbacks between the land and the atmosphere um, and the other and the feedbacks among these major model components, essentially. Uh, and they also try to capture processes like the effects of aerosols um, and other things that we know are important, such as um, increases in water use efficiency by vegetation with higher CO2, things like that. Um, and those kinds of processes aren't in um, the earlier generation of climate models shown on the left. And these climate models, I think, you know, don't capture all these processes perfectly yet by any means. Um, ecologists are still working to learn, um, you know, the water use efficiency example is a great one because we're still look, trying to understand that um, in the current period, um, especially at large scales. 
Um, and so I think the other thing I want to emphasize here is that there are um, multiple variations of each of these model types. So different climate research groups around the world um, produce their own models with some kind of little bit of sharing and learning from each other. Um, and each model captures the physics slightly differently. Um, so there, in general, there's no best climate model. There's no single climate model um, that's better than other models that are available. Um, and that's why uh, climate change um, assessments uh, use uh, what's often termed an ensemble approach. And so they look at uh, what different models project to try to um, encompass the range of possible futures. And so uh, the way that climate scientists study the effects of greenhouse gases is to run each model over the historical period. Um, the most recent uh, set of experiments went through 2005. Um, and then continue running the model um, out into the future under different uh, conditions and assumptions. And so uh, the IPCC, um, has organized experiments with particular sets of conditions that each research group uses, and these are called representative concentration pathways. Um, and these correspond to more or less uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the future. So uh, the uh, 2.6 scenario here, this one that, that sees the lowest amount of warming, um, corresponds to humans emitting fewer greenhouse gases while um, the 8.5 uh, concentration pathway uh, corresponds to humans emitting um, more greenhouse gases, and the other two are intermediate. Um, and so each model is run under each pathway, um, often multiple times to understand just sort of randomness within the model. So they start each model um, with different initial conditions, essentially with different uh, weather at the start. Um, to make sure that their uh, inferences aren't just based on um, randomness. And so in general, uh, climate models reproduce broad scale spatial patterns uh, well, and this is especially true for temperature. So scientists evaluate models by comparing the historical simulation um, essentially what the model expects for the current period and the past um, to observed climate data from that. So that's to the often these same kind of gridded products that are based on weather stations. Um, and uh, temperature is generally modeled with less bias and less variation among models than precipitation. So here on the left, uh, we see the average predictions of temperature um, across models. Um, and you can see it gets the general pattern, you know, the biggest scale patterns, right, of you know, warmer temperatures towards the equator and um, colder temperatures um, at higher latitudes and higher elevations. Um, and on the right, you see the average amount that the models diverged from historical climate. So that's called their bias. Um, how much were they wrong on average? And as I mentioned, there's no single climate model that's better than others. So um, model performance varies among different regions of the world and for different seasonal summaries of precipitation, temperature, and other variables. In this figure, um, each model is seen here as a row, um, and each seasonal summary is a column. So for example, these are precipitation um, for different months. Uh, this is uh, December, January, February versus June, July, August um, in different regions. And uh, the number one model in, shown in brown is the one with the lowest bias, which means it was the closest match to the historical observations. So uh, looking across each model, we can see that um, there's, you know, we look across each row and we can see there's a mix of, 
uh, brown, which is good, and uh, blue, which um, implies worse performance. So this, again, is why um, we say that there's no single model that outperforms others. Um, and that's why different uh, regional studies um, can have preferences um, for models that perform well in their region, um, as well as for models that uh, could be excluded from consideration because of their poor performance. And I think it's worth noting that for some variables, the lack of observations can make it hard to assess climate models. So here, this is especially true um, for measures of extremes. So on the left, we see um, observations of the maximum amount of precipitation um, that was seen in a five-day period, um, and for the number of consecutive dry days. So that's the number of dry days um, that happen in a row. And, and again, this is from um, the historical period, but you see that a lot of the world, particularly in Africa and parts of South America, um, you know, northern Russia, Russia here, parts of Australia are, are white, and that is because they, the data quality for the historical period isn't actually there. So um, as I mentioned, precipitation um, is less, you know, correlate, is less correlated over space, so varies a lot um, over short distances. Um, and for that reason, uh, it's hard to know the number of dry days, for example, here in the Sahara Desert, although, of course, we know that um, it's likely to be a large number. Um, so essentially, these white periods show locations where the observed data wasn't even good enough to calculate um, a value, whereas the climate models um, produce uh, values, you know, the complete overland. Um, and so in these cases, deciding how well the model has done is really hard because we have so much uncertainty in the historical information. Um, and uh, because of that, it's hard, it can be hard to know, especially in these um, less studied regions of the globe, uh, kind of how much weight to put on model projections of change in these types of variables. All right, so um, climate model output is rarely used directly in ecological studies for two reasons. Um, the bias that's found in the climate models and the core spatial scale. So bias, as I mentioned, means that the model produces conditions that are too hot or, or too cold or too dry or too wet compared with observations. Um, and the core spatial scale means that each model grid cell, so here GCM stands for Global Climate Model, and this is what the mountains over Switzerland look like to a climate model. So each model grid cell is really big. Um, and so variation in topography, variation in elevation um, within a cell isn't included. Um, and instead, the cell represents an average over um, the area that it covers. And so um, this one on the left is what these mountains of Switzerland look like in reality. Um, this is the elevation here where red is, hot, is higher elevation. Um, that's captured in something called a regional climate model, um, which can do more focused studies of small areas. Um, and then this is at the global scale. So um, in the big grid cell of a global climate model, uh, the elevation um, is averaged, and the mountains m maybe not even half as tall as they are in reality. And so because of that, if we want to ask questions like, are there refugia where um, species will um, have habitat, essentially where it will remain cold enough for species to survive in the future? Um, these climate models can't answer that question directly because basically they don't see the tops of the mountains. They don't see mountains at the right height. Um, and so the solution to this problem of the spatial scale is downscaling, 
And the solution to this problem of the bias is bias correction. And these are um, two different uh, processes, but they're often done um, in tandem, and so they're often linked uh, in terms of the data products um, that are provided. So I'm just going to go over really quickly first um, kind of a general overview of bias correction, and then uh, I'll touch on a few different methods for uh, downscaling. So um, bias correction, as I mentioned, is used to adjust uh, model output to make it usable for studies um, that are trying to assess the impacts of climate change. And what it does is it removes the difference between the climate model output and observations, and it essentially uses the historical period to look at how big is that difference. Um, so, so here we'll see this is um, an, a common method of bias correction uh, called quantile mapping. And in blue here, we see the observations. This is something called a cumulative distribution function. Um, and it shows what proportion of observations um, were a different, at a different temperature. So this is maximum temperature. And the coldest ones are you know, 7 degrees C. Um, and 20% of um, temperatures uh, were below about 12 degrees. And you know, 60% of temperatures were below about 18 degrees, and so that's how we read this kind of um, figure. 100% of temperatures were below, you know, 28 degrees or whatever. Um, and so th this is the historical observations in a given grid cell, in a given, given location. And this uh, dash line is used to represent the, or um, is a depiction of the predictions of the um, historical simulation of a climate model. So basically it shows that this climate model um, is too warm, it has a warm bias, it's too hot um, in the historical period. And so uh, what's done basically is that um, at each quantile, as these are called, um, it, the, it, this process looks at how much does the climate model need to be shifted back to match the historical observations. And so it shifts them back, um, and then it applies the same shifts to um, the future. And so basically, um, you take out this bias while preserving the differences in um, what the climate model predicted or projected. Um, and this is, again, just one method and a relatively uh, a relatively common one. Um, so it shifts each part of the distribution separately according to the amount of bias um, in that part of the distribution. And it's generally done within each grid cell and at a monthly or daily time scale. Um, and I think for somebody that's using these climate data, a really important thing to recognize is that these climate data are from global climate, data from global climate models are bias corrected to a particular observational data set. Um, so to a particular gridded data set, um, and of course I say observational um, because they're based on historical data, but as I mentioned at the start of the talk, there are also estimates. Um, so this shows an example uh, that was produced by folks at the uh, North Central Climate Science Center. Um, that's focused on Yellowstone, because as I mentioned, climate products for the historical period can um, differ more in the mountains. And for those of us that um, aren't uh, familiar with the western US, Yellowstone is one of the um, large major parks, national parks in the western United States. Um, and so what you see is that um, this this line represents the PRISM historical data set. This line um, that's dotted here represents the Maurer historical data set. And the climate models, the historical simulations, are basically on top of this Maurer line because that's the data set that was used to bias correct them. These are bias corrected um, outputs. And so 
you wouldn't want to compare, um, do something with, with PRISM data and then compare it to, um, you know, the future of these uh, climate models because basically you'd be mixing up uh, the difference between these historical data sets with um, the difference uh, in climate um, that's due to greenhouse gases. And so uh, we always kind of want to use the historical simulations of the climate models um, as the basis for comparison. Um, and there are a few different ways of doing that that I'll talk about at the end. All right, so uh, remember that in addition to the bias, the second problem that makes GCM output hard to use directly is the coarse spatial scale. Uh, so downscaling is the process used to get projections at a finer spatial resolution. A few major categories of downscaling. Um, one of the most common ones uh, and simple methods is the delta method. And so what this does is it, you, it looks at how much change was there between the GCM's historical simulation and future simulation, and it simply applies that amount of change, the amount of change that's in the climate model, to the historical climate observations. Uh, a second category of methods is statistical downscaling, which models the relationship between broad scale and fine scale climate during the historical period and then uses that same relationship um, to generate fine scale uh, projections looking forward. And there are many different methods of statistical downscaling, um, and I'm not really going to talk about them um, in, in detail here. Um, but in general, they're, they're widely used um, in ecology and in other fields such as hydrology. And then the, the last category of downscaling methods is um, often referred to as dynamical downscaling, which uses a regional climate model um, which has a finer spatial resolution, but for an area that's smaller than the globe. So, for example, for North America or for Europe or Western North America or some sort of uh, regional area like that. Um, and that's a model that actually models the physics at a smaller scale. Um, and so I'll briefly go over each of these categories um, in just a tiny bit more detail and talk about products that come from them. Um, so the, what the delta method does um, is it applies the mean change uh, that's projected by a global climate model to the historical climate. And so um, it takes the difference between um, a climate model's historic change in the mean, so this is like delta, which stands for change, in the 0.5 um, spot on this cumulative probability, and it adds it to every place on the historical um, uh, temperature distribution. And so it shifts the mean and the hottest temperatures and the coldest temperatures all by the same amount. So if a model uh, projects that there's going to be a three degree increase in mean temperature, um, the coldest average and hot temperatures in the historical period would all get shifted by three degrees. And this is um, an incredibly uh, common method. And so widely used data sets in ecology are based on this method. And this includes WorldClim, um, which uh, has this gridded historical data, and then they've calculated those mean changes and um, applied them to the historical data to get uh, future projections. Um, and other data sets that are more um, regionally available, for example, Climate um, NA, um, and I think these data sets, these data are also available for uh, South America, I believe. Um, so these are all based on the, the Delta method. And there, there's advantages here for studies that are um, driven by mean change because these data sets are relatively easy um, to access and to use. Um, and they usually serve uh, 
climate information in over 30 year periods. Um, for example, 1970 to 2000, and then um, corresponding periods uh, in the coming century or the current century, I guess. Um, so there, these are really widely used data sets in um, ecological studies. All right, the second major category, um, as I mentioned, is statistical downscaling. Um, and this uses a model to uh, produce projections of change at a much finer spatial resolution than the global climate model. Um, and the choice of the method affects the details. But in general, um, the statistical downscaling preserves the patterns of change that are seen at the course level. So this is a GCM, and you can see each grid cell here. And I think this is actually even re-gridded to one degree. So it's even a little bit finer than the GCM had in it. Um, and the statistical downscaled method has much finer grid cell sizes. So you can't see each cell individually, but in general shows um, a similar pattern of projected change um, in temperature. Um, and brings in some additional information um, about uh, that's driven by like the elevational patterns um, that we can see and th that the model essentially can know about at this finer spatial scale. So in contrast to um, the delta method, statistical downscaling um, preserves the projected difference in the um, rate of change of the mean climate, so this is like the 50th um, percentile of conditions, um, and in the extreme, so, uh, you know, the 5 percentile or the 95th percentile. So um, in this example, uh, the climate model is predicting that the hottest temperatures are going to increase faster um, than the average or the colder temperatures. and Statistical downscaling preserves those projected differences. So um, using this method can be valuable if the system you're looking at is driven and is affected by these by hot weather events. So for example, if you're interested in coral mortality, um, that's going to be driven by uh, these um, shorter time periods of, of hotter uh, weather, and you're going to want to capture the changes in the extremes. Um, and some recent work that I did with uh, colleagues at the Climate Science Center and elsewhere um, shows that emphasizes kind of why this is really important, and it's because the means and the extremes can change at different rates. So in the top panel here, we're seeing the projected change in a mean July temperature uh, between um, essentially now and the end of the century. Um, and then in the bottom panel, we're seeing the projected change in the hottest July day that's expected over a 10-year period. So, um, and that, in some regions of the country, that changes much more than the mean changes. And I'd like to um, note that this particular spatial pattern uh, it's just in this one single climate model. Um, and so different climate models might show different patterns. But in general, uh, this, this uh, reality that they project different rates of change for uh, extreme climate compared to mean climate uh, is a common one. Okay, so the last uh, piece that I wanted to talk about here, I'm really just going to touch on, um, which is dynamical downscaling, because it can capture and really model processes at smaller spatial scales that, that global climate models would miss. So um, the, uh, this is a, a figure from a coordinated kind of experiment um, that's producing uh, dynamically downscaled models and comparing them. I mean, this one's at a 50 kilometer resolution, but some of these models go down to four kilometers, and at that level, they can even model um, things like thunderstorms, which which aren't which are captured statistically rather than mechanistically in a global climate model. And so uh, these uh, regional climate models um, provide can provide more realistic depictions of 
um, especially short-term processes and especially short-term um, precipitation amounts. Um, I think that said, they're not widely used in ecology, mostly because the data that they produce isn't um, isn't as widely available and, and as easily accessible. Um, and I think in general, uh, people interested in using this kind of approach um, would definitely benefit from collaboration with uh, climate scientists to kind of understand um, the benefits and also uh, make sure it's being used appropriately. So in this last part of the presentation, I want to um, talk about sort of some generalities in um, how we use climate projections in ecological studies. So I'd say that the first step um, in, in any study is always, should always be understanding and identifying the key climatic drivers of the system that you're working on. Um, and that includes what variables are important. Is it temperature? Is it precipitation? Is it evaporative demand? Um, and also over what time scale should those variables be summarized? So this is an example from uh, work by Brooke Bateman um, and her colleagues. And this shows uh, differences in model output over the historical period um, between models based on short-term weather variables and models based on long-term climate averages. And the short-term, the, this is an example for the Fox Sparrow. Um, and the actual range is highlighted in black here. Um, and the long-term, just using the long-term averages, kind of the model predicted relatively high suitability um, in large parts of the United States where the species does not occur. Um, and so this, including these shorter term weather variables, uh, helped sort of reduce that wrongly predicted suitability um, here out east. So kind of understanding both what variables are important and what time scale um, they should be summarized is really an important step for any system. Um, I think that, that simple sensitivity analyses um, are incredibly useful. So these shift the climate by a fixed amount. Um, and these can uh, give a sense uh, of what might happen to ecological systems. And so this here is an example of a really nice study um, that measured evaporative water loss in uh, birds in relation to um, temperatures. Um, and this is based on like lab work and um, really kind of a mechanistic understanding. Um, and then they use that mechanistic understanding uh, to predict where birds um, might not be able to survive in the future. So that's these kind of red and black areas in the Southwest. Um, and this, you know, in terms of how they accounted for climate change, it's a really simple method. You know, they, they added a fixed amount of change. But at the same time, I think because the study had a really nice kind of mechanistic foundation, um, it's, it's a really valuable approach, and especially for um, relatively small-scale areas, uh, this is incredibly useful where, where there's not a lot of variation in what uh, climate models project. For example, if you're interested in a single park, um, the climate model might see that as, you know, one grid cell, so there's not going to be at the GCM scale, spatial variation in the rate of climate change. Um, so this approach becomes really useful and quite easy to implement. Um, the other thing I'd say as a rule of thumb is uh, for studies that do generate predictions over space, it's important not to interpret them on like a cell by cell basis. So the broad scale spatial pattern is much more reliable than the difference in projected change between adjacent cells. And so patterns driven by uh, elevation, um, such as here where the mountains are cooler than the plains, um, those kinds of patterns are, are reliable, but um, you want to be wary of kind of focusing on 
um, differences uh, between one cell and the cell next door um, because those that's like really not the spatial scale at which um, global climate models can kind of provide really reliable inference. So a common question uh, for studies interested in projecting the impacts of climate change is how to decide um, how many global climate models, which ones, and what pathways uh, to use in their study. Uh, so for studies out to um, mid-century, like the 2050s or earlier, I, it makes sense to just focus on one representative concentration pathway because uh, there's more variation among models than among pathways at that time scale. Essentially, it takes um, there's a lag in the response of the global climate system. And uh, for the end of the century, uh, those pathways have diverged. And it, it's common in ecological studies to compare uh, the 4.5 and 8.5 uh, concentration pathways. So in terms of uh, the climate models, um, models that perform poorly in a region or for um, the variables of interest, like if they get, get the seasonal pattern of precipitation wrong, um, those models should be excluded. Um, unfortunately, that kind of assessment has to be done using the raw climate output, so output that has not been bias corrected. And it's really something that I think sits in the realm of climate scientists rather than ecologists. And so ecologists can use kind of climate model performance assessments and comparisons to to get this sense, and um, those, I think, are actually sorely needed, especially for poorly studied regions. Um, so there are different strategies in terms of which models. Um, one approach is to use as many climate models as is possible or realistic for the study, um, and another is to span the range of projected changes under different climate models, so to include models that predict more or less warming. Um, and this is an example of information that's available. This is from the Climate NA website, um, and it looks at uh, different climate models here in each row, and these are different um, U.S. states and the, the whole country, um, and shows the rate, the projected amount of um, temperature change uh, from each model. So you can see some models project uh, less warming um, than other models for the same um, concentration pathway. So a useful tool is to look at um, the amount of change in mean annual temperature and annual precipitation. Um, this is work that I did with um, some colleagues where we actually randomly chose 10 models, but a good approach is to kind of cover the corners of this kind of distribution as well as a model in the middle. So someone might choose um, you know, five models in that case, or maybe three models that represent different um, scenarios of interest. Um, and it's important to develop ecological projections based on um, each climate model separately. I think that's really worth emphasizing. You don't want to average um, the climate data and then use it um, to generate projections from an ecological model. You want to predict to each climate model um, set, you know, and each RCP separately. Um, and then in some cases, the ecological results are average, but I think it's really useful to show um, the variability in the ecological um, projections. And so, um, for example, this is uh, for a species, projecting a species range, and here this shows uh, the range projected by different um, eco ecological models run under different climate um, models and assumptions. Um, and this is each one. Uh, this shows here in, in panel B the area, this green area is where all models predicted suitable habitat. And the green is where half, excuse me, the blue is where half the models predict, projected suitable habitat. And the purple is when, is where, uh, any one model did. And so this kind of uncertainty assessment um, can be really useful. And here again, this is a similar way of showing um, these types of patterns. 
Um, and so as I mentioned, these, these different methods, the two widely used methods, uh, the delta method versus um, basing ecological projections on uh, downscale data are kind of alternatives. And I think um, kind of a, a general strategy is that if long-term means are key drivers of the system you're interested in, um, then using this, the delta method makes sense. And so this is a figure that just shows how that works. Basically, uh, the historical simulation, the future simulation of a global climate model is compared, um, and, and a delta, or the amount of change, is calculated. And a data set like WorldClim does this for us already. So it provides historical observations, and then it provides those historical observations shifted by the amount of change project, projected by a climate model. And so this is just shows a generic statistical model for an ecological process. And we could make predictions based on um, historical or current climate and make predictions based on this um, shifted climate and then compare those for an ecological uh, assessment of projected climate change impacts. Um, and again, this here we're just taking the long-term mean change. So this is a strategy that really makes sense if that's the key driver. Um, and then the alternative, um, and this is, uh, I refer folks to the paper for more information here, um, but this is work my colleagues and I have done, sort of emphasizing that if extremes are key drivers, then another approach is to kind of estimate the statistical model as usual based on um, historical climate data, and you want to use the data set that the climate model was bias corrected to, and then make predictions to both the um, historical simulation of the climate model and the historical, I mean, excuse me, and the future simulation of the climate model. Um, you sort of compare to make sure that the predictions, or i say evaluate to make sure the predictions under the GCM historical model make sense and are reasonable. And then um, if they are, you can go to this next step of saying, okay, what, what um, is going to happen or may happen to this ecological system in quote-unquote model space. So um, really comparing ecological predictions that are based on uh, a comparison from the GCM historical and GCM future simulation. Um, so if uh, people are interested, uh, I'd encourage you to look at this um, recent paper um, as well as, uh, and there's a lot of actually citations in this work uh, that point to more information about, um, you know, downscaling methods and um, other details of what uh, global climate models are uh, sort of do well and where um, we might place less confidence in their projections. Um, so with that, I'll uh, take any questions. All right. Um, uh, is there a citation? I'm just going to go through these questions here. Uh, and the first one, I don't know now what people, I guess this, everyone can see this. So is there a citation um, for an Earth system model? Um, the figure that I used was from a paper by Heavens et al. in um, 2013 in Nature Education Knowledge. Um, and that's on the slide. Uh, and I, there are other review papers, um, you know, that essentially go over Earth system models. Um, so I, I don't want to list citations off the top of my head, but we can follow up with those. Um, so let's see, question two. What do you compare the model to to assess model bias, e.g. temperature, actual station data? Yeah, so the um, climate models are compared to um, historical climate information. Sometimes it's, um, it's uh, gridded uh, observations, and sometimes it's uh, from what are called reanalyses. So that's where um, it's sort of a mix between a climate model and gridded observations. So they use uh, observations where they have them to kind of keep the model on track. Um, and so those are also useful for 
um, assessing bias. But yes, in general, it's two uh, estimates that are fundamentally based on uh, station data. Let's see, question three, what about the white cells in the last slide, 14? Um, I think that's a model that just didn't, so in 14, this is the slide where we're looking at model performance among uh, regions and metrics, and it was that kind of colored um, array where brown was good and blue was bad, and um, those models just didn't produce uh, that variable, um, or it wasn't assessed. I'm not, I think we'd have to go back to the paper to uh, double check which one. Um, but yeah, some models, uh, you know, don't produce um, all variables, and I think that's especially when you're, like the Earth system models um, have more outputs than the, the climate models. Uh, let's see, question four. Can we get citations for the references you mentioned? Um, yeah, I think the sort of short version of the citation is on the slide, and um, I can provide uh, the organizers with longer versions of the um, ones later. Uh, let's see. How do I translate suitability values to the general public? This is a great question, so I assume this is related to kind of a habitat suitability modeling um, type output. And actually it's hard because in most cases uh, these suitability values aren't, can't be interpreted as probabilities, which is what people often want to do. So a 0.5 does not necessarily mean that um, there's a 50% probability that the species is there and actually um, each model um, has a different, uh, like, we term it an op optimal threshold, so a different cutoff for where the model would predict um, that the, a species is absent versus present. Um, and so I think this, that's one reason that often binary maps are used instead, so um, a modeler can convert uh, these continuous suitability values um, to the binary map, which might be easier to communicate. Um, but I think uh, another thing that we can do as modelers is kind of assess uh, what's, it's, it's termed calibration. So essentially that asks how, um, how close is a 0.5 to meaning that there's a 50% chance that a species is there. Um, or, you know, in, in some cases, and for really common species, you see this more like a 0.2 um, might be uh, like a high enough value for the species to be there, or a 0.8 or whatever. It, it can be quite off from 0.5, so um, I think you know, this kind of communication um, is hard. I think it's, you know, in reality, uh, these suitability metrics um, also need to be communicated to, like, managers of, of resources, right, of uh, wildlife and habitat managers. Um, and luckily, these are relatively common tools. Um, and it's, but I think, nevertheless, we still don't want to assume that people are always um, interpreting these suitability values correctly because it's very common to want to consider them a probability when they're not. All right, let's see. Are there any web links to have evaporative water data? Um, yes, there are. So there, there are two different sort of main types of products that relate to um, evapotranspiration. Uh, one of them is a potential evapotranspiration or evaporative demand, and so that's really a function of um, the climate and weather. Um, so how much water does the system want to suck from the earth? And then there's actual um, evaporative amount, 
there's the actual evapotranspiration is what it's called. And that's something that actually can be uh, derived by um, remote sensing methods. It's also an output um, from um, climate models. But usually it's something that's, that's used for the historical period. Um, I know of uh, one product uh, that's produced by Gabriel Sinai, who actually works in collaboration with a more central climate science center. Climate science center. It's called SSEBOP. S S E BOP. I think is um, is the acronym. And that basically uses it assumes that um, evaporation cools the earth, which we know it does. Um, and transpiration as well. And so uh, the, the difference between land surface temperature and air temperature um, will be less uh, when there's a lot of evaporation going on. And when you have um, a dry place, i.e. there's no water to evaporate, um, we know that those surfaces heat up. So that's why like a um, a uh, desert floor could be really hot because there's there's and much hotter than the air. There's no water um, to evaporate and hence cool the land surface. So um, yeah, it's actually a great question and something that kind of lies at the interface of I think this kind of remote sensing and climate um, data exploration. Let's see. Um, question number seven, who's the author of Africa maps with different predictions of a species distribution area in slide 33? Let me go to slide, see what slide 33 was. I think it's, um, this is, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize that the, um, that the citation isn't on this slide. It's a paper from, uh, by Arujo and New. It's a 2007 paper in a journal called um, Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Um, Arujo is spelled A-R-A-O, oh no, A-R-A-U-J-O, yeah, Arujo and New, N-E-W. Um, and the journal is Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, and it's a well-known paper, we can add the citation there. Um, let's see, are those climate analysis tools available worldwide? Unfortunately, I'm not sure which climate analysis tools this question refers to. I apologize. Um, question 10, would you recommend to run MACA for bias correction with a data set like PRISM or GridMet for a specific watershed? So um, the MACA, MACA is a climate um, downscaling method and data set uh, that's produced by uh, John Abatsaglu and his colleagues who are the same uh, group that produced the GridMet data. Um, and MACA is bias corrected. There's a version of it that's bias corrected to GridMet and there's another version of it that's bias corrected to a uh, data set by Ben Livna, which is an updated version of uh, the Maurer data set. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it's Ben Livna is uh, the, if you want to fill in the brackets, it's L-I-V-N-E-H. Um, but basically, I don't recommend that um, any ecologists attempt to do the bias correction themselves. Um, I think that that's, a complex bias correction and statistical downscaling are really complex and um, are kind of best left to the climate scientists and to the climate downscalers. Um, and luckily, um, these products are becoming um, more widely available. So um, MACA uses, it stands for multivariate uh, constructed analogs, I believe. Um, and that's a product that's available um, pretty much just over the conterminous United States. Um, okay, uh, let's see. How about for climate change impacts on water yields? Would the delta method be appropriate? Um, I think it depends, basically. I think it depends on um, what 
time scale uh, you're interested in in terms of water yields? Is that sort of, if you're interested in average water yields over a 30-year period, um, it might be appropriate. If you're interested in variability in water yields year to year and whether that might increase, um, I would guess that the delta method would underestimate um, that variability or essentially just um, you could apply it in a way that the best you could do is sort of get the same amount of variability probably with uh, a shifted average essentially would be my, my guess. I'm not, I'll say that with a caveat because my specialty is not modeling um, water yields by any means. Uh, let's see. Um, where can we find more examples of application of your methodology and or more information about that? Um, I guess I'd first be uh, quick to say that this actually isn't a method that, that uh, I came up with. It was, um, I was an ecologist uh, that had the good fortune to collaborate with um, climate scientists and um, those, what we call the model space method is actually widely used in hydrology and um, is essentially taken as a given in that field, um, but it's really not, hasn't been often applied to ecological studies. Um, and so uh, when I got interested in assessing climate change impacts, I, I kind of read a lot of the ecological literature and didn't see some of the lessons that I was learning from these climate scientists there. So um, that's, that was the driver for writing um, a paper that kind of summarized uh, those methods. But yeah, I would point you, I guess, to that manuscript, which is a manuscript that came out this year in Global Change Biology, um, and we can add the formal citation. Uh, let's see. Question 13, can you explain a little more about downscaling method? Doesn't downscaling increase bias? And is there any tool available to do downscaling? Um, I guess I would say that I, I don't think we have time to get into all the different um, statistical downscaling methods. Um, there are a, quite a variety of methods that um, yeah, that, that some of them are based on essentially disaggregation, so they, and some of them are based on um, the MACA example we talked about earlier, that's based on what's called an analog approach, so it looks at um, the across cells, the pattern um, at a local scale, and how that matches the pattern at a broad scale. Um, I think downscaling it, I mean, I'd say no downscaling in general doesn't increase bias per se. Um, it also doesn't necessarily provide added value, so it doesn't necessarily change, doesn't necessarily improve the climate change signal. It just brings it to a smaller spatial scale. That's true for statistical downscaling now. I think dynamical downscaling can um, really provide additional levels of information. Um, is there any tool available to do downscaling? Um, not really. The, these, uh, I'd really recommend kind of sticking with products that are out there and produced by climate scientists. Um, there, there are a lot of assumptions that um, go into different downscaling methods and um, there's a lot, a lot of active research going on in terms of developing um, and improving um, downscaling methods. Um, for example, there are more complex versions of the Delta method um, and so on. And so I think if you're interested in developing downscaling methods, it's definitely an active area of research. Um, but I'd say as an ecologist, um, I think it's, it's not so hard to apply the delta method, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend producing um, statistically downscaled outputs um, without close collaboration with an expert in that area. Um, let's see, uh, I guess, these are, were we almost at the end of these questions? I could keep going, or somebody can unmute themselves and cut me off if you want me to. Um, 
Uh, let's see, what remote sensing data is freely available for climate studies? Um, I think I'll, I'll defer that to the um, uh, kind of remote sensing experts and um, uh, because in general we don't have, we can't look forward with satellite data, right? So we can use remotely sensed information for the present period and um, the recent past, but you know, we don't have remote sensing data for the future. And so we can get similar variables and use them for things like um, checking the reliability of climate model output, but we can't really use remote sensing data going forward. Um, I guess I'm not sure I understand this question. Is there any contradiction regarding the interpretation of different models? So I will skip it. Um, are there any MATLAB tools? I actually code in R, not in MATLAB, so I do not know. Um, is there a maximum value of the delta that tells us that the model cannot be used? Um, I don't think so. You know, honestly, there's been, if anything, models have underestimated rather than overestimated the amount of change that we've seen so far, I would say, in general. Um, so I don't think any sort of absolute cutoff is really the right way to think about it. I think um, we want to instead be looking at whether the models really capture um, the key processes that are important in an area. So, um, for example, in the southwestern United States, um, you know, monsoons are really important to understanding warm season precipitation. And so some models capture the monsoon well and some don't at all. And so it's more that kind of physical process level that we want to ideally be assessing um, these models. Um, so let's see. Um, the next question, when we want to use ecological modeling, is it better to use weather station data or GCM data? So um, I'd say it depends on the scale of your question. Firstly, what uh, and kind of what, what exactly you're doing. So if you have a, a local study area that's near a weather station, um, by all means you could use that weather station data um, instead of historical um, gridded climate data. So whether the to use weather station data or GCM data, I think in general um, you want to kind of understand the process and study the process first with um, observations, whether that's from a climate station or gridded, um, and then sort of look like in the model space kind of method uh, to see whether the GCM historical simulation um, gives reasonable results for the area and system you're looking at, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there since uh, it's 11.15 and we can follow up on um, some of these other questions in the future. Great. So thanks so much, Helen, for that uh, really great presentation and thanks for sticking around and um, providing some answers to these questions. And um, thank you all for being here with us today as well. And as a reminder, next week we will have another guest speaker. We'll have Brian Miller, also from the USGS Fort Collins Science Center, and he'll be giving an overview of scenario planning. Um, so if those kinds of questions, hopefully he, we, he will address next week. And um, thanks again, everyone, for, for being on, and we will talk to you next week.